We are live at Goddard Space Flight Center here in Greenbelt, Maryland. I'm Erin Kislik, and today we are celebrating 25 years of Hubble servicing. So you may be wondering, what exactly is servicing? The same way that you take your car in to get the tires rotated, to get the oil changed, sometimes satellites in space need a little help. Luckily today we've got a panel of astronauts from all the Hubble servicing missions here to tell us a little bit about their experience and about servicing. Um, so stay tuned for a great show. Take it away, George. All right, thank you, Aaron. Good afternoon, I'm George Morrow. I'm the Deputy Director of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. I supported the Hubble project as a systems engineer at the time of the deployment mission. I was the observatory development man uh, manager uh, for the first servicing mission. Hard to believe that was 25 years ago. Uh, I, I still can't believe it. And I was the flight systems and servicing deputy project manager for the second servicing mission. So I have quite a background on, on Hubble. Uh, the agenda this morning concentrated on the situation NASA found itself in after Hubble's launch, when it was discovered that the main mirror was not figured correctly. And then the heroic first servicing mission that corrected the problem was discussed. There would be five servicing missions in all that required years of preparatory work on the ground by scientists and engineers. But after all the tools were developed, the hardware for the observatory built and tested, and the upgrades to the ground system finished, it fell to 32 astronauts to execute these missions and the original deployment mission. Each mission had its uh, own overall purpose. Some were to save Hubble that was hobbled by the, the blurred vision or in, incapacitated by broken gyros. Other missions were created to expand Hubble's vision with new instruments designed to detect different wavelengths of light and one was to simultaneously upgrade its science capabilities while outfitting it to last for as long as possible. Each mission had its own set of challenges, yet they all had the same amazing result. The astronauts succeeded in every task on every mission, making each flight a complete success. We are fortunate to have with us seven astronauts representing the deployment mission and all five servicing missions today. They're here to tell us about the challenges of working in space. So now let's meet them. So the first, he piloted two shuttle missions, including STS-31 that deployed Hubble and commanded two additional missions, including the historic first joint American-Russian space shuttle mission in 1994. He has a distinguished 34-year career in the Marine Corps that included flying over 100 combat missions over Southeast Asia. He would go on to serve as the 12th administrator of NASA for over seven years. He is currently an independent consultant in aerospace, STEAM education, leadership, and national security affairs. Please welcome Major General Charles Bolden. The second is a veteran of five shuttle flights. On his first mission, he made the first STS contingency spacewalk in an attempt and rescue of a malfunctioning satellite. His fourth flight, he would conduct three EVAs as part of the first servicing mission to Hubble and install the historic Wide Field Planetary Camera 2. He would move on to become NASA's European representative in Paris. He is currently a professor in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Please welcome Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman. She was a mission specialist on four shuttle flights. Her first flight was a Department of Defense mission. Her second was on the maiden voyage of Space Shuttle Endeavor where she evaluated space station assembly techniques. And her third flight was the first servicing mission for Hubble where she installed COSTAR, the robotic device with corrective mirrors that compensated for the uh, inaccurately figured primary mirror. She is currently a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at my alma mater, the University of Virginia. Please welcome Dr. Katherine Thornton. He flew four shuttle missions, including the one that launched the Magellan probe to Venus. On his last mission, Hubble's second servicing mission, he performed three EVAs and installed two new instruments, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph 
and a near-infrared camera and a multi-object spectrometer. He completed a distinguished career as a pilot flying mostly F-4s and F-16s and as a commander in the United States Air Force and is now the Director of Aerospace Facilities for Affiliated Engineering Incorporated. Please welcome Colonel Mark Lee. Our next astronaut visited Hubble more than any other with three servicing missions to his credit. During those, he conducted eight spacewalks. He also flew on two earlier shuttle missions, including one to the Russian space station Mir. A physicist by education, he would serve as NASA's chief scientist and would later lead all science for NASA as the associate administrator for the science mission directorate at NASA headquarters. He is currently an emeritus scientist here at Goddard working on Hubble observations of Europa and collaborating with Goddard and JPL on the next uh, on the design of the next generation of serviceable telescopes. Please welcome Dr. John Grunsfeld. He piloted two shuttle missions and served as commander of the last two Hubble servicing missions. He was assigned to NASA headquarters as Deputy Director Requirements Division of the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate and later served as the Chief of the Exploration Branch of the Astronaut Office. He was an accomplished pilot in the Navy flying F-14A and F-14D Tomcats and made his Hollywood, Hollywood debut buzzing the tower in the movie Top Gun. He is now the Senior Vice President for Civil Programs at ASRC Federal Engineering Aerospace and Mission Systems Group. Please welcome Captain Scott Altman. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, he is a veteran of the last two Hubble servicing missions. He performed four spacewalks and, one of the, and was one of the first to repair an instrument in space, an activity that was not designed into the hardware. He holds five degrees and has been on the faculty at Rice and Georgia Tech and is now a professor of mechanical engineering at Columbia University. You often see him in documentaries on the National Geographic and Science channels, but today we get to see him here live. Please welcome Dr. Michael Massimino. So it's great to have all of you here. Please make yourselves comfortable. Uh, and so we're, we're really chomping at the bit to hear about the challenges and lessons learned across all the missions. Each had its own amazing stories. So now we'll hear from them. I'll ask them some, some things and uh, get them to talk about them. So first, really for Charlie. Charlie, I'd like to ask you the first question from a former astronaut perspective as well as from a NASA administrator perspective. What do you think were the top one or two most challenging aspects of Hubble servicing? Ooh, I'm not the right person to ask, first of all, since I was not a servicer, but uh, I can tell you about the one or two of the most challenging things about delivering it. In, uh, and the people here at Goddard played a key role in, in working through it. One was getting it out of the payload bay when we uh, had the RMS, the remote manipulator system, the, the uh, robotic arm, uh, didn't work exactly the way that, that we had trained. It actually was not accustomed, I think, to, the, to the, just the mass of Hubble. And so when we started what was to be a straightforward, just lift it out, uh, Dr. Steve Hawley, who was the RMS operator, found that it was beginning to pitch and roll and do all kinds of things. So I, I was called to do my duty, which was to read him numbers so that he could keep it straight as we took a, uh, what was supposed to be about a five or 10 minute evolution and turn it into maybe an hour or more. And then we got a uh, high gain antenna deployed, got the first solar array out, second solar array started. And I'm looking at CEPI because I think we got 16 inches out or something like that and it <laughs> stopped. And uh, we spent the rest of the day um, trying to figure out what was wrong. And if I, if I get this story wrong, somebody in the audience say that's not right. But I was, we were told that there was a young engineer here at Goddard who said very early on that I don't think there's anything mechanically wrong. I think it's something called the tension monitoring module. Uh, the irony is that the late Bruce McCandless, who was on the crew with us, as soon as it stopped, Bruce said, hmm, 
I think it's the tension monitoring module. <laughs> and for those of you who knew Bruce, the rest of us on the crew looked at Bruce and said, what the hell is a tension monitoring module? <laughs> and several hours later, it turned out that that's what it was because they turned a one into a zero and the solar array went out and we hustled to get into the appropriate attitude and deployed it. So those were the, the two things that almost stopped Hubble from being Hubble. Although Bruce and Kathy never got to see the deploy because they were in the airlock uh, at, at um, vacuum getting ready to go out and actually perform a manual deploy of the final sub, uh, solar array. So. Right. So even on the deployment mission, the crew trained for contingencies. And, and as Charlie said, they were in the airlock waiting to go out. Yep. I remember that very well. But the story is I heard that if, if they had just waited another minute or two to reset that tension monitoring device, the airlock would have been open and they'd have been out of there, but too that's, late. That's why they have never forgiven me to this day. <laughs> <laughs> they blame me for the guys here at Goddard being very efficient. All right, thank you, Charlie. Let's see, for, for Jeff and Kathy, maybe. You had the honor of being assigned to the first servicing mission, which was much more complex than anything that had been done previously. What worried you the most before launch? The, this mission was certainly the most complex shuttle mission that had ever been attempted. And there were so many people along the lines who had felt that it was too complicated, that the chances of everything working right were too small. Um, but when you really come down to it, I think the thing that goes through the mind of everybody when you're getting ready to open the airlock and go out is just, don't screw up. <laughs> I don't want to be the person who breaks something on this telescope that isn't already broken. And then, of course, we got to get our job done, which we did. I was concerned that the instruments weren't going to slide in the way they were supposed to. I think every satellite we'd touched in orbit before that, there'd been some problem and, and some workaround to get it to work or not work. And I would bet you money that we would have run into something in installing the CoStar and the WIFPIC 2 That something wouldn't have been built to the drawings we had or whatever. Something would have gone wrong and they wouldn't have gone in. And we would have had to you know, back out and think about it some more, hopefully be successful, but it, it just went amazingly smoothly, and that's thanks to the folks here at Goddard that maintain that high, high fidelity simulator. Yeah, I think the, the configuration control, the attention <coughs> that was spent on configuration control, knowing exactly what tools were gonna go on, what bolts and everything, that, that was a, had a lot of responsibility for the success of the mission. You just, you can't forget about that. And as I remember working, working the mission, uh, uh, Frank Seppolina's mantra was test, test, and retest, train, train, and retrain. And I think it, uh, it really paid off for, for us all. Absolutely. Following on to that, so you actually experienced, you both actually experienced some unexpected challenges during your mission. If you can <laughs> tell us about those, some ideas might be uh, the doors. Uh, chasing a screw and maybe a solar, the iconic image of a solar panel. Well, I'll talk about the great screw chase. We talked a little bit about the doors this morning, but um, on the last EVA day, we, um, well, there were these two solar array drive electronics. Again, very simple pieces of equipment, so chances of failure are very small. And anyway, there are two of them. So they weren't actually designed to be what we call EVA compatible. You know, instead of one big bolt that you could loosen and pull the whole thing out, they had, if you all, the people old enough here remember SCSI connectors. So we had about eight SCSI connectors <coughs> with little two millimeter screws, which are supposed to be captive, but uh, up in space, the, the wires don't just lie on the ground, they're sort of floating, and, and as they move around, the, the screws start to spin, and half of them spin clockwise, which is okay, but the other half spin counterclockwise, and they come out, and so as we were doing the work to try to remove these and put the new ones in, um, because, uh, yeah, one of them did fail, and that got People scared that, well, if one failed, maybe the other one would fail, which in fact it did, and they had to replace it on the second mission. But So we were uh, basically, these little two millimeter screws were floating around. Well, we have little trash containers that we have on our, our chests. 
So you'd grab a screw and, and put it in. But after a while, when you would open the trash container to put another screw in, you know, two screws would, would come out. It's a diffusion process, right? Well, they've, they since, they, they redesigned those trash containers so they, that wouldn't happen. We, we learned a lot. Uh, anyway, at one point, Story, he was um, on the arm that day with his feet locked in, so his mobility was limited. I was free floating, so I was just holding on. Story reached for a screw, didn't quite get it, and, and tapped it so that the screw was headed down towards the payload bay, which you don't really want stuff floating around in there. It might get in a piece of uh, a motor or something, mess up the payload bay doors. Anyway, I tried to grab it, but it was about a foot farther than I could reach. I was holding all the way on. <clears throat> Claude, who was operating the arm, said, OK, hold on, Jeff. I'll drive the arm, and you can get it. Well, it turned out that the maximum speed at which the arm could move was exactly the speed that the screw was moving <laughs> away from it. So you know, I was moving, and, uh, and, 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 and this is where the training really comes in, because uh, Ken Bowersox, who was the backup arm operator, remembered that there's a certain bit in the software that tells the arm that it's loaded. And if the arm is loaded, either with a satellite or a person, its maximum speed is limited. So he quickly floated over, reset that bit to tell the arm that it was not loaded, and the arm speeded up, and I was able to get the screw, and that was the great screw chase. <laughs> There was a, I'll talk about the solar array, but there was also another chase, if you remember, at the end of your fifth EVA where Story had a whole oh, string right. of tools that yeah. got away from him. You know, you have all this stuff and it's floating around you like this giant cloud of junk. And, and sometimes you don't know whether it's connected or not. So it turns out this whole stringer of tools was not connected and it got away from Story. And Claude, Claude was awesome. It, it, Story just said, up, Claude. And Claude looked, he saw Story, and he saw the tools, and the arm went, oh, and he was able to grab it. And we, I don't think we ever reported that to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing the ground ever heard was, up, Claude, which is not an unusual command to hear. Um, the thing that, that I got to do, which was um, something we trained for but not fully expected, and that's to release one of the solar rays into orbit. So one of them rolled up just like it was supposed to, and then the other one was retracting, and um, there was a um, kink in the by stem, so it wasn't going to retract properly. And as soon as uh, Covey saw the blankets go slack, he stopped the retraction. And we knew at that point that the next day we were going to have to go out and, and toss it overboard. So Tom and I went out for EVA 2, and that was our first job, was to go up there and disconnect it. So Tom, um, I put a... a a grapple fixture or a hand fixture on to hold it. Tom was disconnected it from the telescope, the electrical connections in the night pass in the dark, so it wasn't producing electricity. And um, then we, Claude moved me and the solar array away from everything, and we just sort of hung out there until sunrise because we wanted to be able to see the, the um, solar array as it was drifting away from us or we were drifting away from it to make sure that there was no contact. So I was just hanging in there, just holding the thing, and um, one of the other concerns that, that we'd had on the ground before flight was that if I ever got in a position where I had to just hold out and do nothing for a while, that I would get very cold because my resting metabolic rate is lower than the minimum metabolic or minimum heat produced or in the suit. And I was going to get very cold. So they made me put on these overgloves as if the gloves aren't clumsy enough. I had to put on overgloves over the top of those. So I just held on to it until... The sun came up, and then everybody got in position. Tom got in position where he could actually see what's going on, and I just turned loose. I didn't shove it. It looks like I did, but I really didn't. I just let it go, and we were floating along together with no rates. Claude moved me back away from it, and then Ken Bowersox, the pilot, fired the jets to separate the orbiter from the solar rays. <clears throat> if you've seen video of that, we showed some this morning, that when the, the jet plumes hit the solar rays, it sort of bent over and then flapped back. And it looked like this giant um, pterodactyl cruising over, it turns out, the deserts of the Middle East. It was the most mesmerizing, beautiful image that I can imagine. And, and I had the best view of anybody, so I hung out there and watched it for a while. And we all did for a little bit until we decided we had to get back to work. But it was a pretty awesome thing to see. It was an amazing thing to watch from the ground. Let's see, that will move on to Mark. 
Mark, you had your own challenges during servicing mission two. The first involved the, some paint and handrails. Could you tell us about that? Well, uh, when we finally uh, went up, the stubble had been up there for about six years, and that's the first time we really saw the effects of being in space for that length of time. Uh, some of the handrails had uh, the paint, uh, yellow paint, and it uh, came off, and it kind of, as it came off, it stayed in one piece, but it just kind of wrapped around the handrail. So it was kind of like this little curly Q fry uh, that's kind of sitting on, on the handrail. And it's one of those things where, you know, the regulations within NASA said, well, you got to paint the handrails yellow. Well, it's not like we didn't know what the handrails were. And having, having paint on them for 25 years, you know, when you look back at it, you know, that probably didn't make a lot of, you know, sense. It should have been anodized or something else if you wanted to highlight them. But the other thing about Hubble is, you know, you look at the pictures and you see this beautiful thing, even from, the, from inside the cabin, and you go up next to it, and there's all kinds of little craters, like from you know, grains of sand and different things that have hit it. And it's kind of like looking at the, the moon, where you can see that it's been up there and it's been taking uh, some hits. And the other thing that uh, as a result of being up there, I think, I don't know if they noticed it on servicing mission uh, one or not, but uh, as we undid the bolts that were holding the doors closed, the plating on the bolts, I think it was nickel plating, uh, was coming off as well. So you had some debris from the paint on the handrails, and you had little pieces of metal or metal plating that were coming off. And as everyone's talked about before, you know, having that kind of stuff <laughs> inside Hubble, you know, or get up in, in uh, you know, if, if, when the lid is open, if some of those particles get up there, it could affect the science on board. So it was something that over time, uh, we just started to see a little bit more of the degradation, and a lot of lessons learned there as far as what you want to do uh, with a satellite that's going to be up there for a long period of time and people are going to go back to is that uh, there are things, and I don't think they expected the bolts to fall apart. I don't think they expected the paint to uh, come off like that, uh, but we learn from things like that. You also had some experience with uh, the, the uh, external insulation on Hubble degrading. Right, and that's, that's another one uh, where uh, someone here could tell me if they anticipated that, where the, uh, the aluminum, basically it's aluminum foil that's on the doors. Because of the heat or the sun being on it, it would cycle you know, back and forth, and eventually it uh, fatigued, and you know, there was big pieces of it that were starting to come off. So it really wasn't doing its job anymore because it was just like a sheet of paper that had been ripped up and was still hanging on. So uh, can someone tell me if they anticipated having, nobody's raising their hand, I see, so. Did you anticipate that, that happening? We did some testing at point five and eight. Okay, all right. You never told us. <laughs> 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 so, both so, we had, so we had to put together inside Doc Horowitz, who's not here, he was one of the guys that inside, he was a pilot, and he had to fashion some, um, some uh, you know, makeshift uh, panels to put on, uh, which were then on subsequent missions, uh, they were replaced. So, uh, but it was something that uh, you know, I didn't know about, but uh, it was just the results of being in space for that length of time and somebody going back and visiting it. Yeah, it seems like the first servicing mission was just the right amount of time in orbit for Hubble to have uh, to have those materials issues showing up, and both the both the uh, the handrails and and then the, the the insulation were were worked on in in subsequent missions. So let's see, moving on to uh, to Scott, John, and Mass. Uh, U3 teamed up for both SM3B and SM4. Your SM3B mission had a different type of malfunction that almost stopped a critical repair. Can you describe and talk about that for us? Sure. We had, uh, like all the missions, a very ambitious profile, uh, five back-to-back -back EVAs. And on the third EVA, uh, our job was to replace the power control unit. So this is the central switch box for Hubble. And that in itself was very challenging. We had 36. Uh, connectors that we had to remove. It was not intended to be replaced. Uh, very simple bus bars and, and Lear switches, uh, Lear relays. Uh, 
But uh, we had to change it. Uh, and in fact, I remember with Ed Weiler going to see Dan Golden uh, to brief him because uh, it was a big enough risk to the Hubble that if we didn't fix it, we knew we'd lose the Hubble in a period of years. Uh, if we tried to fix it, there was a pretty good chance we'd lose the Hubble during the mission because we had to, for the first time uh, in Hubble's history and for the first time for any spacecraft, entirely power it off. Uh, and as soon as you power off a spacecraft, it starts getting cold. So there were time clocks. So everything was choreographed. There was a uh, huge macro of commands that was developed, a super command set. And even before we started the EVA, they started one after another shutting down Hubble systems. And so as we started into EVA prep, they started shutting down the Hubble. Now, I'm going to pass it over to Mass, who was in the airlock. So Rick Linehan and myself, we got into our spacesuits. We were up against the wall. We were doing our pre-breathe to purge all the nitrogen out of our bloodstream. And there's a certain step where uh, you get taken off of the wall to float free. You know, you're in, getting into your suit bolted to the wall. And then you're released to float around in the airlock. Then you take, you know, then the crew gets out, closes the hatch, and you start depressing. Uh, and Mike Massimino and Jim Newman, you know, flipped the latches to unlatch me. And then, and and then, then uh, yeah, it, well, first of all, it's great to be here, everybody. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs> Seeing everyone here is just uh, really, I don't know who thought of this. I guess it was just 25 years and so you had to have a party or something. But it's just really great to, to see all these great faces and people here and to be with these guys again. Uh, so thanks for whoever's responsible for making this happen. This is great. Um, but what happened on that day, I was the new guy on, uh, you know, on the crew there. Was it, uh, Dwayne Carey Digger was the other rookie. And, and uh, so I was, just, I remember Newman, Jim Newman uh, and I were in the airlock. And I remember Jim felt, he must have felt water in, on, on you. You didn't know what was going on. You no. couldn't see a thing. Right. So John was kind of you know, getting moved around, you know, not knowing really what was happening. And Jim, and we, and Jim noticed all this water. And he grabbed a towel, and I, I remember someone said, I don't know who it was, maybe, I, I don't think it was me, but someone else on the crew said, are we going to be able to you know, go out? And I remember Newman saying, he's not, not in this suit, he's not. And it was just that we had, a, we had the water leak. And then I remember getting into the procedure, and John the whole time, you stayed in a suit, I think, the whole time, didn't you? Oh, no, we, I, I eventually got you Rick, out of there. Rick but, stayed in a suit. Oh, Rick you stayed in a suit. But we were kind of manhandling you a bit there right. for a while, and then eventually it was decided we were going to have to reconfigure one of the suits him for John. face down on the mid-deck. Now, I'm the commander. I haven't trained with the suit techs or anything, but we got John face down on the mid deck. We're wiping up all this thing, and I'm screwing around here. And somebody, it was probably me, pushed something that disconnected a box, and all of a sudden his suit depressed. Like, ah, we just ruined there, the there, protocol. There, there was that, yes. We, 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 I forgot we were about that. Out of that suit we, broke, anyway. we broke a lot of rules that day. <laughs> I, I forgot about that. But, uh, but the bottom line is if you have water in the back of the spacesuit, and you go outside, uh, as soon as you get to low pressure, that water is going to flash freeze. And if there's water in electrical connectors and plumbing, water expands a little bit when it freezes, and it'll break the suit. And you know that would have been the end of me. And then we wouldn't have finished the EVA. So that would, that would have been bad. In the meantime, the ground is freaking out, because suddenly they're turning Hubble off, and they're put in a position, well, you know, do we undo that? It could take hours to change the suit. Yeah. Um, you know, scooters trying, scooters trying, Scott Allman's scooters trying to manage, you know, this whole thing on board to, to figure out how we recover. But we had trained pretty well, and we had trained how to resize suits and change suits, not on time pressure. You now, this would be an overnight thing. Uh, and, and we said, yeah, we can switch suits, and we, know, we knew what parts to change. And so I got a Newman's suit, uh, but Jim Newman's, you know, six feet tall. And you know, I'm 5'8", so we had to shrink it a little bit uh, and change gloves and all of that. And when training, I had a rule, which is if you're going out EVA that day, you don't help resize the suit, because it involves a lot of tense, difficult hand operations and moving things. But we threw that out the window, too, because we had to go fast. And I had never resized the suit. He was like, OK, do it like this. <laughs> All yeah. right, yeah, we hope dragged, it works. We dragged everybody into it. And so in the matter of an hour, we'd resized the suit. I was back into a new suit back in the airlock. And, uh, and it Jim went Newman fairly and Mike quickly. Massimino. I remember we hopped right to it to help yep. with the ground. And, and, uh, and I got back right in, in the airlock in a new suit. I looked over, and Rick was sound asleep in a space suit. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
hanging out on the wall for like a couple hours. Yeah. Yep. And then I think that spacewalk is, and that was the thing is that we were so concerned about that PCU EVA, yep. and then to have this happen before we yep. even got out the door uh, and worried about timing, how long it was going to take. But that, was that ended up being our, 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 our fastest so, spacewalk out of the, out of the on five? On that mission it was, and, and this task was so complex and believed to be so difficult that we had all these portions where if we ended up at the end of the day and it was all only halfway through, yeah. you know, we'd figure out some way to jury rig wiring to keep Hubble alive overnight and finish it the next day. And, uh, and uh, yeah. you know, Jim and Mass had been trained how to finish it up. But, you know, the amazing folks uh, here, and there's too many people who have been involved in each of these missions to thank individually, but, you know, led by, you know, Frank Seppolina, the EVA ops team, the folks at Johnson, uh, that we had trained this difficult task over and over and over again. And in fact, we had a, this is, uh, was talked about this morning, but a high fidelity PCU trainer uh, in the big shuttle simulator building at Johnson. And every night when I went home, I would do this task. So I had done this hundreds of times by the time we got to orbit. I knew every connector personally, every keyway, every wire, you know, and, and, and Rick too, that this was the only EVA that actually took the amount of time that we said it would, which was six hours and 30 minutes. Now, of course, plus the hour or hour and a half to resize the suit. So it was still a long day. Um, but, but what's really amazing to me personally is, you know, that you know, everybody on board accommodated the fact that we almost lost that EVA that we figured out how to solve it. We got back in the game. The ground was back in the game. The, the Hubble ops team you know, was able to get Hubble into the right place. And so by the time we were you know, 15, 20 minutes into the spacewalk, I'd totally forgotten that we'd had the whole yeah. suit issue. And everybody just operated right back on track. Now, on the inside, remember we were on Columbia, which had an internal airlock sticking in the middle yeah. of the, the uh, mid-deck, so which nice takes to up a ton. <laughs> We were happy when they were outside because there was a little more room inside. <laughs> and I noticed a lot of my food was missing when I came back. <laughs> so on the same mission, you also had uh, uh, trouble with a stripped screw on the handle of the spectrograph. Tell us how you got around that. Yeah, that was the next mission. Oh, was it? Yes, uh, that uh, was yes, yeah. right. That was uh, four. Yeah. So the uh, yeah the uh, you're talking about the handrail. You're talking about the mistake I made. That's what you didn't want to say that. We had a problem with a strip that. screw. It's, that. it's not a mistake. It's an opportunity. It's an for, opportunity. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Mark Mark Turgeon was. We were just talking about that, and we were saying, you know, how how fran you know how frantic he was. You know, I don't want to speak for him, but you know, everyone was nervous. I've heard a lot of stories of what was going through the team's mind when I stripped that screw on this handrail that needed to be removed so we could access the power supply. And he said, but it's turned into a good story, and it has. So now he has to, you have to ask yourself. Was the this is a good story, you know the way we had the way we fixed that. And I'll get to that I guess in a second here, but but was it worth the aggravation? And I looked at him, and both of us said, no, it wasn't. You know that whole that whole that 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 experience of going through that. I uh, I think it was the easiest thing we, we thought we were going to do that day, right, John, on that spacewalk. Those bolts out. Yeah, and those bolts. We were worried part about of the task. yeah for that ta so that task in general, the whole STIS task and then the ACS test that that uh, occurred the day earlier, right on EVA three. So this is EVA four in our mission. And um, it was this, the, we started working this task years before we were assigned, although you know, the mission got turned on, the, but we were looking at ways you could repair STIS. This was uh, the challenge of the team, and we were trying to help as, as much as we could, but it was you know, the people, many of the people in this room that made it all happen. And I think over 100 new tools were designed for that yep. task, and a lot of effort was put into this, because for the first time, we weren't just gonna remove an instrument and replace it with a new one, but we had two instruments with power supply failures, and we had to figure a way to, uh, to undo something that was never intended to be undone. You know, these, these instruments were all buttoned up and ready for launch, and never, no one was ever supposed to mess with them ever again, but that's exactly what we did on our mission. So it took a lot of creativity to figure out ways to remove what we needed to remove to get inside and then remove these power supplies and put a new one in. And, and uh, I think we had backups for just about every other screw. We, were, we had 111 small screws on the panel, two more on the, on the clamp, and then there were four on that, on the bigger screws on that, on that handrail. And they, we weren't worried about those. Those were big hex head screws that we were gonna use with the PGT. That was the only screws I was gonna undo with the PGT that day, our big power tool as opposed to the mini power tool. And of course, uh, I stripped the head on one of them. And uh, the bottom, on the bottom right, the, 
The two on the top and the one on the lower left came out fine, but the one on the right just wasn't going. And I looked and I saw what I had done and I destroyed this. The, and and you my can't, heart just sunk when you that You can't happened. take the panel off unless the handrail is Right. Fine. We can't, yeah. And I quickly did the deduction. Now, that screw doesn't come off, the handrail doesn't come off, 111 screws don't come off the panel, power supply doesn't come out, new one doesn't come, go back in, this does not come back to life. We'll never find out if there's a life in the universe and everyone's going to blame me. <laughs> that's the way I figured. That's, that was quickly how I went, so masses, went through that. So, masses outside with this problem. And you know, inside, we're trying to think of ideas. The ground is trying to think of ideas. Um, eventually, on board, we did identify that we had a socket that could take the big bolts that hold the stanchions on which the handrail was on. But that socket was inside with us. Yeah. But, but the ground was working on other ideas. Yeah. And, and I've, it took four hours for us to eventually get the solution called up from the ground. Um, and you know, we're inside watching Mass, Mike Massimino here, and Mike Good outside and thinking, you know, this has to just be you know, nearly impossible you know, for those guys to be out there not knowing that we have a solution. You know, we can talk. We can go get something to eat. You know, and, I think you just, I'm and, just hearing this now. You could have told me a lot earlier. And uh, <laughs> you know, we're thinking, OK, we've got to keep their spirits up, because yeah. you know, this, this could be devastating. You, know, you don't want somebody to make a mistake. You don't want them to. You know, to cry in the suit, you know, that water could cause <laughs> float around and get in something. But it was, uh, you know, it must have been incredibly challenging to be out it was, there. It was tough. There's a couple things. I remember one thing that I learned from Jim Newman on my first flight that I kept in mind was uh, no matter how bad things seem to appear, no matter how hopeless the situation is, you have to remember, you can make it worse. That's right. And that's, and that's what I kept thinking. <laughs> I'm serious. That's what, that's what we used to say. And that's what I kept thinking that. As bad as this was, if I started losing tools or if I unhooked myself, and at that point you might not want to come back and get me, I was worried about that too. So I knew I had to, you know, I had to stay in the game and not make things worse and let the team do, their, do what they needed to do. But so Jeff, uh, Jeff Roden's there and, and, and Rezac and thousands of others are out here that worked that problem here, or not thousands, but a lot of you are out here. Um, and I, I think, you know, there was, it was a very tough moment. And I was kidding around early about we would, I, I would rather have that spacewalk go, go uh, smoothly. But it turned out OK. And I think what it showed to me was I learned so much on that spacewalk about my friends and the team here getting through that, that I'm glad it worked out the way it did, even with that strip screw. I, I'll never forget you guys were trying to get my attention in a window. When I, was, I was fetching some tools. I think I was getting vice grips and tape. I still didn't know what the solution was. And I had to come up to the, to the toolbox at the front of the orbiter. And you guys were in the window, and I didn't want to look at you guys. I felt terrible, like I had, I had messed up our, our mission. And I just felt horrible about just trying to get, you know, not make it worse. Maybe we'll get up with a solution. I really didn't think we were going to come up with one. And I remember looking up at the window at you guys, finally, and you guys are giving me thumbs up and OK signs. And I'm like, what the heck is going on here? I thought there was another spacewalk going on. <laughs> but what they, were, what they were doing was they were trying to get me going. And I realized at that point that we were a team. And we were going to either succeed or fail as a, as a team. And you guys kept me in the game. And, and I realized that, well, we might be going down, but at least I'm going down with my best friends, is the way I figured it. <laughs> but it all worked out. I've got to throw a shout out to the ground. There was another failure, on, which, which actually went back to our mission. That was your fault, actually. Well, that was, that was yeah. the thing. Just, just briefly, because you know, the WIF pick two that we put in, you had to take out in order to put in WIF pick three. Yeah, and you overtorqued it. Well, yeah. I, I wasn't going to bring wait, that up. Wait a minute. So, so they, you know, they, it was true who was doing that, right? So, yeah, the torque limiter, um, it, it wouldn't move. So they said, you know, increase the torque, yeah. still yeah. wouldn't move. You know, the, we use the torque limiters because you don't want to break the bolt. Because if, if you break the bolt, then you're never going to get it out. But finally, they said, and, and I was watching this, and, and I was thinking to myself, I put that bolt in. And I did use a torque limiter, and I called out the number that was, and I actually, I called Milt Heflin. You remember that, Milt? Um, um, you remember? And I said, you know, what, what's going on here? And I think you called Sue, uh, who, who was the EVA lead. It turns out we had different torque limiters. And, and there's a, there, there is a, an error bar on torque limiters. Oh, actually, actually, now yeah. we I mean, the full story is that that torque limiter had error bars, yeah. and it's temperature dependent. Yeah. And you were at the cold side of the temperature, and it was well out of the range 
of, it was actually very close to the breaking torque for that particular bolt. So as my uh, two-year-old son always used to say when, when something went wrong with one of his toys, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> But in the end, finally the call came up from the ground, and it was, uh, it was not a, this is how you fix it. It was a question. Uh, and the question was, do you think mass can pull that handrail with 60 pounds of force? And instantly, I knew we were <laughs> saved. Because where mass was at that point, he probably could have gotten 200 pounds. <laughs> I, I think I could have removed the instrument well, if I needed to. I was. So we're talking about that. I'm, I'm as the commander. I'm thinking, okay, what could happen here when he pulls this panel? I'm thinking, mass goes wham and breaks his <laughs> visor. Right. Wham, rips his suit. I'm like, ah. But the ground said, okay, it's only 60 pounds. I'm like, okay, I think we can handle that. And the way they knew it was 60 pounds was they mocked it up in a room and put a fish gauge on it and pulled it till it broke. And they had a video of it, but thank God they didn't send that up to us, because if I'd seen that video, so when the thing breaks, you know, it's not restricted, it goes bam, 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 like, nah. That was after the mission when we'd got, done it okay. I was like, oh, no, it was all right. You can and find they, that and, on YouTube, by the way. And they didn't show it to Tony Sakachi, our flight director, either. Thank yeah. goodness, that was smart. <laughs> that, that is one of the most remarkable things I've, I saw in any of the missions. <laughs> um, well, let's see, let's move on. So, so uh, back to Scooter and Charlie. You were both commanders of, of two missions, I think. Uh, Scooter for two Hubble missions, Charlie for two other missions. What, what, in your mind, are the biggest challenges that, you know, Hubble servicing is, is, is one thing and unique, but what are the challenges that crews in orbit on your missions faced? You wanna go first? Uh, I'll, I'll follow you, sir. I, I, I was going to go back to the, the lesson that Jim Newman mentioned to, to Maz. That's actually Hoot's Law. Yep. Hoot, that's Hoot's Law. Hoot's Law is, 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 is the, it's the law called Hoot's Law. And from Hoot Gibson. The first, from Hoot Gibson, who was my first commander, my, my mentor. And Hoot's Law was stated when Jim Newman was one of our trainers. He was not an astronaut. He was a trainer. And uh, I killed my crew one day uh, on an ascent sim. I, I, I shut down. Uh, a good bus when we had a bus short and it took out the second main engine and we went into the Atlantic Ocean and died. And as we're laying there, Hoot reached over and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Charles? And I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> because when I got in trouble as a little kid, my mother always said, Charles Frank? So I said, yes, Hoot. He said, did I ever teach you Hoot's Law? I said, no, sir, Hoot, you did not. He said, well, it goes like this. No matter how bad things are, you can always make them worse. <laughs> and so that was Hoot's Law, and that's where Jim Newman got it from, and it, and it served us very well throughout the rest of the program. But anyway, going back to the most difficult thing, I think it was people. Um, my, most, my most difficult challenge on my two missions as a commander was trying to make sure that we had a, a collegial crew that we all worked as a team, that we all understood that um, this, you know, like you said, Maz, this is a, it's a team effort. We, we either all succeed together or we fail together. It doesn't make any difference. And, and we actually, I did something that Mike Coates had actually done, and uh, we were heavily chastised for it because no, no commanders had ever done it before. I actually brought the psychiatrist in. And, um, and we did the Myers-Briggs and everything. We, brought, we even brought spouses in. And, um, and what I wanted the crew to understand was we knew each other working around the simulator None of us had ever failed together. None of us had ever been under stress together. And so what I wanted the crew to, to understand was how does a person with this personality type generally react when under a lot of stress? And it turned out to be incredibly useful to us because we did have one situation that was totally unexpected because you always have crew members that are kind of, you know, you, you just kind of say, boy, are they gonna be okay when, we, when, we, when, we, when something comes up? But it was invaluable to us to understand how we could help each other if we got under into a real stressful situation. And I had learned that from Mike Coates, who did the same thing with one of his crews. So I think the people skill uh, was the hardest thing for me as a commander. 
Well, I have to agree with you, and not just because you're a former administrator, but <laughs> because I had the same same experience. Well, I mean, it's you, because you had to fly with me and Matt. I, <laughs> you, you take a group of incredibly talented people, and the thing that you want to do is take all those individual skills and form a team, and especially a team with all the folks on the ground that are training you and working with you. And uh, going through those sims, coming up here to Goddard, working with people was a key part of bringing success on the flight. Now something we did that was kind of similar to what Charlie mentioned is before the flight, uh, my crew and our flight director did a National Outdoor Leadership School experience where we went kayaking up in Prince William Sound in Alaska for 10 days uh, out in the middle of nowhere, giving each other a chance to be a leader one day, a follower. There was a lot of stress when you've been paddling <laughs> for uh, eight hours and you're coming in to land and you see a bunch of bears where you're supposed to camp. You're like, ah, <laughs> we're going somewhere else tonight. Uh, and a, a chance to understand what was important to people. Like uh, uh, I had a crew member who was very vocal about what the opinion was. All right, this is the thing we should do. This is the only thing I think that you should be thinking about. And then we'd talk about it and we'd say, okay, well, we're gonna do this. And I was worried that uh, they were just like, no way. But I found out the person, as long as he'd been listened to, said, okay. I had my uh, chance to talk, now I'm, I'm willing to go with the group. So it was really good insight into the crew. I helped, think it helped us bond. Having our flight director there helped keep us from having that us versus them from up there to down there. So yeah, really great. Well, one other thing I'll add, and that was because Scooter mentioned it, was for the commander establishing a rapport with the, with the flight directors, the, particularly the lead flight director. And I, we had a thing about landing, and we had a, a, a close in aim point and a, and a normal aim point. And I just had this habit of, I believed, I believed in the orbiter as a system, and I was never worried about running off the other end of the runway. The engineers were definitely afraid that one of these days we're going to run an orbiter off the other end of the runway. So, so they were always they always wanted you to, to use the nominal aim point, which puts you farther away from the runway. You got to remember the orbiter is a glider, and it's just coming down. And um, but I knew that I was always more comfortable just getting me to the runway. I can stop it. There's no problem, and we more than enough runway. And um, so I remember one day we had had a, a session, an entry session, when the computer, all the thing that figures out which aim point you go to, uh, was going to send us to the normal aim point when, when the winds were a little bit higher than I was comfortable with. And so I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to the, to the close end aim point. And before we went down to the Cape for that particular flight, I remember sitting down with the lead flight director and I said, Lee, let's get one thing straight right now so that we so that we can be happy when we come back. If you try to send me to the nominal aim point uh, on a day when the wind is like this, I'm going to politely tell you that I'm not going to do that. So, so do me one favor. Don't you know, leave the selection of the aim point up to me unless it's really extreme, because I do not want to land in the water, uh, and I do not want to land short of the runway. We had two shuttle landings that actually when you normalize everything, we didn't make the runway because the touchdown was like 165 knots or something like that and you're supposed to land 195. So go figure. So that was, I, I always talk to the flight, Milt is here and Milt will tell you, I, I think the, com, the camaraderie between the flight directors and the commander, the whole crew actually was, again, it's a people thing and it was really critical for, for us to get into each other's head and know what to, he, he needed to know what to expect from me as much as I needed to know what he was thinking about uh, on the ground. We, we certainly felt that camaraderie with Milt. We, uh, after every flight, we go on a post-flight trip and because of being, being in, with a European connection, we, we had some nice trips over, over in Europe and we insisted that Milt come with us. And Milt wasn't the flight director, by the way. I didn't want to imply that. He was our flight director. No, no. I, I mean, he wasn't the one that I had this discussion. Oh, okay. With. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bring you up here. <laughs> all right. Opening it up a little bit as far as uh, Hubble and serviceability goes. So with all of your experiences, tell, tell us a little bit about what... Um, so Hubble was designed to be service, so to speak, right? 
Um, there were things that were designed and, and, it, uh, and intended to be serviceable, and then there was things that you all did that were never intended to be done. But tell us a little bit about how Hubble was designed to be serviceable and what about the observatory made that uh, the most friendly. And, and, and on the opposite side, tell us what, uh, what you saw about Hubble that could have, uh, could have been done to make it more friendly. Well, you know, from the very beginning, when we talk about EVA serviceability, um, you're, you're working in a bulky suit, your visibility is limited, your, your tactile capabilities are limited, and so the object is to make the interfaces as simple as possible. I mean, ideally, if you have to take something out, if it's held in just with one or two large bolts that you can put a big uh, wrench on, that, that's a much easier way than when you have these little two millimeter screws. So, and then, uh, as far as taking the, the big instruments in and out, they were really well designed with, with uh, mechanisms so that you know, if you push them in, you know, we had to sort of get them started, but then there was kind of a little triangular mechanism so that as you got further and further in, you were guaranteed that they were gonna end up in the right place, and that was critical for the optical alignment. So, I mean, all of those aspects were, were interesting. I'll let someone else talk about the things that didn't work so well that weren't designed for service. I think things that were designed for us to take apart had captive features on it. So if you had to back out a bolt some way it was captive, it wouldn't be floating around and have you know, one more thing for you to chase after. But then even on the first service mission and certainly on the later ones, we ended up doing things that were never intended to be done. And so they didn't have captive features. So Jeff talked about the great screw chase and uh, I know on, on one of our EVAs, we took off the solar ray deploy electronics box, which was bolted to the inside of one of the doors there. And it had um, you know, a bolt and two washers, I guess maybe eight of those. So if you think about it, you back off this bolt, you're not only chasing the bolt, but you're chasing the two washers, trying to get them in that trash bag thing. So knowing that we were gonna do that for that mission, um, I think it was Tom Akers who came up with the idea of a hairpin. So these really simple fixes that you can do to make it, it um, EVA compatible. So we, we, we backed off the bolt a little bit, sh moved the washers out away from the box, and then stuck this hairpin on it that had a, ca had a, a tether hook on it, and we managed to then capture the bolt and two washers you know, with one device there. So um, you know, things like that, we can, if we know we're gonna do it, we can find ways to make it EVA compatible. But some of the things that they did and, and, and some of the things that we did as well, we didn't, um, didn't know we were gonna do them. But I think if, if there's anything we've learned, it's that the ability to predict what you're gonna have to service and what you're not gonna have to service, we, we have <coughs> a great track record. I mean, a lot of things that we didn't think we'd ever have to service, we ended up servicing. Well, I think going in, it might have been that it's impossible, it can't be done. That's why it wasn't designed to be yeah, serviced, well, and then it became possible. Yeah. To, to or me, they I were so simple that they would never fail and they did fail, both the magnetometers and, and the SADES. Yeah. yeah, one of the most important things I think about Hubble is it was the proving ground for a lot of the stuff we did on station mm -hmm. uh, because it was uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, payload that was built to be serviced and we went up there several times. We learned a lot from that uh, and a lot of our testing that we did for space station components uh, fed off of the experiences on Hubble. So it was extremely valuable uh, for the whole shuttle program and that we learned so much about going EVA, doing five in a row or things like that, uh, how the suit works. Uh, there are a lot of things that were proven on Hubble that uh, had benefits for the station program. You know, my, my experience, you know, I felt like Mikey in the Life Serial commercial where you know, the, the kids say, oh, it's good for you. I'm not going to try it. I'm not going to try it. We'll let Mikey try it. You know, there were always things that folks said, well, it's impossible to fix that. And I'd say, well, you know, I'll do it. And, you know, that's to me the, the lesson that, you know, I think we've learned, and I know Mass has experienced that, that, you know, things that folks say are impossible, you know, we can do. And, you know, I believe that there's nothing uh, on Hubble anyway, uh, and I think doing spacewalks that, uh, you can't do in a space suit that you can do in you know, a, a bunny suit here on the ground, you know, basically, that you can learn how to do it. And that's the, 
the amazing interface between incredible human hands and really good gloves now, uh, EDA gloves, but the amazing human hands, the human brain, and the ability of tool makers to build tools uh, to do these tasks that are sometimes specialized tools, sometimes really simple tools, a better connector tool. And, uh, and you know, in the group that, that Seppi led that didn't believe anything was impossible. You know, we, you know, we rewired the telescope, we replumbed the telescope to fix the NICMOS cooling problem. Uh, we pulled circuit boards out with you know, tiny number four torque set screws. Remember, torque set, torque set screws are designed to go in and not come out. You know, that's the way they're designed, and yet we did that. Uh, and the handrails, you know, we developed covers for the handrails. We cross-strapped the power supplies. You know, there's just an enormous number of fi tiny details of things that, you know, in general, folks said, well, there's no way you can do it, or there's no way you can do it on a spacewalk. I will be so bold as to say, and I could be wrong, we, we may not have undertaken uh, the International Space Station had it not been for Hubble, because we, I mean, right up, and it just got harder and harder and harder, and I remember getting ready for SM4, because uh, I was the, the head of the, the, the review, the independent review panel, and, and we all said, we can't do this. We cannot, this, I remember saying, but I won't say we all said. I remember is, you telling me this, that. This, <laughs> yep. this is too much. And you I know, remember we, fighting. We got too much on our plate, <laughs> and so, Let's spend some time thinking about how we're going to deal with the press. Because we are not, I remember saying this, we are not going to finish all this stuff. So we need to be able to deal with the press to help them understand that this has still been an incredibly successful mission, although we didn't get all five days worth of stuff done. That even though we only did two or whatever it was, this is an incredibly successful mission. So let's, and we spent a lot of time on that, on trying to be prepared, and then we went and did everything. And, and then having lived through, I don't know how many iterations of a space station, with a lot of people sitting down here on the first two rows, we said, we can't do this. This is too EVA intensive. We will never be able to do something like the International Space Station. And I think a lot of us said, you know, but we think we can. And, and we found ourselves doing some things we had never dreamed of, repairing a solar array. I mean, you know, by putting an astronaut on the end of an arm and having them go up and, and literally stitch a solar array that's, that we didn't shut down, as a matter of fact. I'm not sure we would, have, we would have had the people who would have had the confidence to try any of that had they not seen that, uh, you know, Hubble showed us that we're a lot better than we think we are and we're a lot more capable than we think we are. So, so, so building on that though, so um, as I said in the introductory comments, you, you know, the, the 32 crew members, every task that was planned to be undertaken was successfully completed. Say a few words about why you all think, what the reasons for the missions being so successful were. Well, I think it's, comes down to what we've all been saying, which is really the, the talent, the creativity, the skill, and the hard work of all the teams. You know, not just us who, who were lucky enough to go up there and do it, you know, but starting from you know, every technician, every engineer, uh, the scientific community being supportive, uh, even management, you know, all these review teams, but you know, we could have done it fine without all those review teams, but occasionally you know, Gene Oliver or somebody would catch something important. <laughs> And, and so everybody, you know, provided some value, but it was, you know, this is something that folks believed in, in their hearts, that it was a good thing to do, and would put off all the stops, and sacrificing family time, and, you know, and friends, and recreation, and, you know, basically not putting their lives on hold, but championing something that was really important, and they believed in. And everyone was working together in the same direction. I mean, every center every contractor. Um, we've got to fix Hubble, and then for subsequent missions, I think the importance of Hubble had been recognized, and people were willing to put in the extra effort, you know, the, the care to configuration control, the, the incredible preparation and training. And uh, yeah, we spent a lot of time away from home, and, and but so did all of our trainers and, and uh, the 
technicians and the engineers who were working with us. Um, and, and that's what it took, and it paid off. Okay. Um, let's see, let's go back to, to some uh, more specific questions. So one from Mark. So in the mission you flew before servicing mission two, you were the first to test another contingency piece of hardware. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that and uh, whether it was used during Hubble? Okay. Yeah, there probably aren't too many things better than getting assigned to build a jetpack to fly in space. I mean, literally. <laughs> I mean, that's just one of those things where, you know, most of us kind of dream about doing that. So we built this unit called uh, SAFER, Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue, uh, that kind of goes on the bottom of the backpack of the, of the suit. It only weighs about 80 pounds, has thruster towers. Uh, and our particular flight uh, was, or the up, working up towards the flight, uh, was not only develop the jet pack, but j develop the training, test it, and do all that sort of uh, work to uh, have a, a self-rescue device. Now, I don't think you guys wore it on uh, the Hubble missions. It's primarily for space station, uh, where if you fall off space station, you're going to be a really long spacewalk, all right, if you can't, you know, get, your, get yourself uh, back. But, uh, yeah, there's only been eight people that have ever flown untethered in space, not counting George Clooney and Sandra Bullock. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, it, was, it was a pretty special thing to do. As far as training for it, uh, Earlier this morning, they talked about starting virtual reality training uh, on uh, servicing mission one. Uh, we took it quite a bit farther because that was the only way to train was within virtual reality. You couldn't use an air bearing floor or anything uh, you know, like that. Uh, the only thing that was uh, kind of difficult about it was we had to have a hand controller that they had from Apollo that only had four degrees of freedom. And so you could do X, Y, and Z plus pitch or you could do you know, pitch, yawn, roll, plus X. So as you're flying it, you had to switch back and forth the whole time between these two different modes. Uh, that was probably the only tricky thing about it. It worked perfectly, and it was you know, a lot of fun uh, to fly up in space. But it's something that uh, you know, we haven't used. I hope we never use. Uh, but it is, uh, was a great, great assignment to have a, a job like that. Yeah, and, and as Mark said, we didn't fly them on any of the subsequent Hubble missions. So for, for me and NASA, if we came loose, we'd have to commit Scooter to come and get us. <laughs> yeah. and and I, always wondered about, I always wondered about that. You know, we, we were on the fifth day of, of, of uh, mission one. Uh, Story and I were in the airlock, and uh, that's when we were doing the uh, reboost maneuver, which, which they do with the Vernier jet. Mm -hmm. So it, it's about as small an impulse that you can possibly put in. But man, the telescope was going back and forth and back and forth. And I was thinking to myself, you know, if I really did come loose and uh, Covey had to fly the shuttle to get us, I, I don't like to think of what would have happened to the telescope. Well, see, that's why I was worried about it, because Scooter had to decide between <coughs> dumping the telescope and getting us, which that's... might mean no more Hubble, or keeping Hubble and writing us off. That's exactly what I know what trade I would make. He, he said he would come get us. So. Well, hang, hang on a second, because <laughs> that's what he said. Now we're going to get the real scoop here. I cautioned them before they went out on their spacewalks, because, you know, I'm having to stay in. I'm looking through this little window. They're going out on a spacewalk. They got. Yeah. Don't be out there going, oh, Scooter, the view here is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. You only have a little window, but this is awesome. So I said, at the end of your spacewalk, there's one thing for sure. You're going to want to come in. And I got the key to the door. <laughs> How's the view now? <laughs> but, but then, uh, after they were done with all their spacewalks, I had nothing to hold over their head anymore. <laughs> we, used to, we used to brief uh, before we, remember this John, we used to go through the cue card, right, the EVA cue card. It was all these things about, you know, for the suits and what we were doing that day. And it was that line that said, uh, EVA crew rescue. So if you got untethered somehow, you would, uh, the scooter would come get you. And we used to do that line, and, and the joke was, I don't know if you, when Rick, I remember Rick always saying this, EVA crew rescue, don't worry about it, we got three more guys. <laughs> 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 so.
So uh, uh, back to Hubble for a, for a minute, and, and really something common to all the missions. Um, on almost all the missions, gyros were changed out. Uh, that was a difficult task due to, due to where they were situated. I can remember, you know, the practice and the high fidelity and mechanical simulator and, and just can't imagine how you all, you know, uh, were able to do that task. Talk a little bit about that on, for those of you that did gyro change out. Yeah, and, and in fact, you might, you might know that We've had some gyro uh, uh, excitement uh, in the yeah. last few weeks on Hubble too. Well, I mean, the gyros themselves, they're just, uh, you know, a little rectangular box and with, with a couple of bolts on the front. The, the problem is, is getting access in there to, to get at them. Um, when, when the job was originally designed, uh, and, and by the way, the doors that, that enclose the gyro compartment, they also have the star trackers and, and they have big star tracker sunshades on them which kind of get in the way and so the original idea was you have to remove those sunshades and stow them somewhere, Ooh. do the gyro job, uh, which you could then do sort of from the outside uh, and then put all the sunshades back. Well, given the time criticality, um, we had the idea that you know if you could actually slide underneath the gyros and inside the telescope, um, then we could do the job without having to remove those sunshades and save a lot of time. Uh, story was shorter than me, so it, he was the one who went inside, and, and I would sort of insert him uh, because he couldn't see. That's the thing. You know, you're in a spacesuit. You, you have a pretty good view of what's in front of you, but what's on top of you, to the sides, and especially what's behind you, you, you can't see, and, and so when you're actually inside the telescope, we were always, had to be really careful. You know, you don't want to break anything that isn't already broken. So that's what we continually practice. And there was some skepticism among the uh, engineers who were responsible for Hubble that, you know, can you really do this without breaking anything? And I remember uh, what, what Story did at, at one point, we had practiced this over and over for quite a few different water runs, and, and uh, at that point he said, all right, and telling to the engineers, this is our final exam. Come in the water with us, watch it on TV, let us know if you are satisfied that you think it's safe, and if not, we won't do it, but we did it and they were happy and, and so that's how we did it and it, and it worked. And I, I guess that's what's been done, that technique more or less has, has remained with it for the other replacements. Yeah, I think that's a fair characterization. I think, you know, for me personally, putting in uh, RSU number two, which is the middle one, and, and there was a picture shown this morning, uh, you know, I was on the robotic arm and inserted into the middle of the telescope facing up uh, and relatively straightforward to remove. Oh, so you did a little differently. We did, well, we did all three. Yeah, okay. Um, and so for the side ones, you know, got inserted into the telescope, and uh, I, I had Steve Smith's feet, and he's tall, and inserted him using the same technique where you, know, you didn't want to touch anything else. You know, and we, we were allowed, and he was allowed one tap on the handrail with his backpack, and then he had to stay fixed, and the rest was all with his arms because we didn't. Want, we saw where Story had scratched that handrail, and uh, it actually said Story on it. I think he signed it. Uh, but for me, it was really neat because I was being inserted into the middle of a telescope, and I, I suddenly had this thought. You know, although you couldn't see out, the aperture door was closed. That it was like Edwin Hubble being at the prime focus of the Mount Wilson Telescope, the 100-inch telescope, uh, and you know that's you get one one random thought on an EVA. So that was kind of neat, but uh, but it was a very delicate task. Not to mention that you know we were warned that you know there were these delicate flex leads and that you had to minimize the rates and you couldn't bump it. And there were ceramic spacers that were easy to chip. You know you guys learned learned that, and the techs had learned that through through testing. And if one of them gets chipped, then it may not sit flat. And so there were all kinds of hazards and warnings and don't do this, don't do that. And it, by the time you're done, you're just frightened to death of these things. Uh, and so that's why on the last mission, I said, we'll let Mass do that. Yeah. <laughs> we, learned, we learned a lot from the other missions, though, because they had the door trouble on the first one, so we knew when they gave us a door trainer. Um, and then we learned more from when John and, and Steve did, and the team did it on the, on the next, that, uh, on uh, 3A. 
And then on four, we had a pick stick. And I think it was, I, it was you or Drew, I think, came up with that idea of trying to get a tool to insert them instead of having I went a, to the hardware store. And was it the hardware store one. or was it the kid store? It was the toy store, I thought. Uh, it came it was, like a kid, you know, grabber. It was uh, Sears hardware. Whatever. So, so they came back with a little, and we tried it in the pool, and that was, I, I think that's a great example of how the team worked. And, and we tried it concept-wise with this, with this grabber garbage thing or toy, whatever it was, and uh, just that we got off the shelf. And then I think the next series of runs, we had a prototype and we were able to use it. But I'll tell you what I remember about this. I, I'm sorry, I want to tell you guys. Is when I got inside that telescope, let me ask this. The, uh, the it was a Star Trek cover that was right yep. in front of me, right, John? Yep. It was number two on the right, yep. correct? Okay, no, so no, we, that was number one. one was in the middle? Two, was in the two middle? is in the middle. Two is in, okay, number one, one on the right. right, thanks. Okay, so we had number one, sorry, number one on the right. So that's, of course, when Braino threads me in there and I'm in there. And I write the, 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 the cover's right in front of me. Does anyone in this room know who manufactured that cover? I can't remember the name of the company. Does anyone know who manufactured the Star Tracker cover? Hmm. All right, well, I get inside of this thing, and I, never, I, was, I wasn't warned about this, right? But there's a little placard on that, on that Star Tracker cover, right? I didn't know this was going to be there. It's a little metal, it looked like a little metal thing right in front of me. As I get in, I see the thing right in front of me. And it says, manufactured by like, Acme Corporation, Bayonne, New Jersey. <laughs> So 350 miles up on, inside of this great telescope, the words Bayonne, New Jersey, are staring right at me. I couldn't believe this. I had to come all this way to see a sign about Bayonne. If anyone's familiar with Bayonne, New Jersey, it's like a bunch of gas tanks. When you line, when you, the next time you're going into Newark, Newark, New Jersey, look to the right or left and you'll see a bunch of gigantic gas tanks. That's Bayonne, New Jersey, right? Well, we're not too far from New Jersey. Anyway, so I see this, and I thought this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. How could this be inside? How could Bayonne, New Jersey be inside Hubble Space Telescope? So Steve, uh, Story did that on the first mission. Steve had that role in a second. I was, so you know, I, wonder if, I wonder if these guys had seen it as well. So when we landed, soon after that, I, I think Story was, for some reason Story was, and I think KT, maybe you were there too, he came to see us, or somebody was, a, a few of the uh, SM1 crew was there. And uh, so I see Story, and he said, oh, you know, congratulations. I go, Story, did you see that, in that right on that, on that placard, that at Bayou, New Jersey, uh, little placard, and he goes, no, I didn't. I go, how did you miss it? And he goes, maybe I was thinking about the telescope in more important <laughs> like, okay, fine. I thought you were going to say, maybe I had my eyes closed. Was yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm also interested. You said it was the Acme Tool Company? I don't know. Acme, I made up. I couldn't remember the name oh, of it, okay. but it was something yeah, like I, that. I, you know, it's a, the Star Trek That would have been cover. too much. Somebody, no, it wasn't Acme, I, but I want, I can't, it's got to be somewhere. Someone in this room is going to be able to find that Somebody out. Somebody will find it out. So we have about... <laughs> Two or three minutes left, uh, I'm told. Say a word or two about, uh, and only a word or two, two or three minutes, we, we need to, uh, to wrap up on, on time. A word or two, though, about how training and the facilities evolved for training from the time of the preparation for the deployment mission and until 19 years later when there's the preparation for SM4. Well, the one, uh, I mean, we, we talked about how much time it took. Uh, there was uh, one new development in EVA uh, underwater training because uh, Hubble being so tall, we were spending a lot of time pretty deep in the water uh, and you actually were getting to the point where in principle we, we would have had to do a decompression stop and so they instituted a nitrox system. If there are any scuba divers here, that means you have a little bit less nitrogen and more oxygen so that you don't have to do that decompression. So just one more example of the lengths to which the system was willing to go to make it possible to do the sort of training that we needed to do to accomplish the task. Okay. For, uh, you know, I had the, the luxury, the privilege that I was uh, picked as an astronaut in 92 and so even before the first servicing mission, I got to dive on a Hubble mock-up uh, at Marshall. Uh, of course, these folks practically lived there and flew back and forth. Um, but a, a huge development was when we went from the Marshall tank to the neutral buoyancy laboratory at Johnson. Now, it wasn't as deep, so we had to split Hubble in two. Um, but it's you know, really the philosophy you know, that we trained over and over and over again in the pool with other simulators as we were gonna fly. And so there were times on orbit where I forgot that we were on orbit. It was just another day, higher fidelity at the NBL. The other change that I think uh, started with SM1, continued with SM2, then 3A, 3B, and four, is that 
we got ever increasing fidelity simulators, whether they were big simulators uh, or small. So for instance, the door trouble you had, uh, you know, the team built as closely as they could uh, a door simulator so that we could practice that and, and mess up as much as we could so we knew how to close the doors. Uh, and the PCU trainer and the STIS trainer, and you know, I really have to give you know, enormous credit on all fronts uh, and, and folks have, have talked about him already, but Frank Cepolino. <laughs> so John, let me, let me stop you there. Yeah. So we're, we are out of time, unfortunately. I want, to, uh, I want to thank you all for being with us today and sharing your memories and your thoughts, and let's give them all a big round of applause. Five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, or STIS, has capabilities like searching for black holes and looking at the atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars. After STIS had a power failure in 2004, the Hubble team was tasked with replacing STIS's damaged electronics boards on the final servicing mission in 2009, which would turn out to be a memorable day for everyone involved. So for about two years, I spent almost every day with the EVA team, four crew members. We practiced that repair many, many times, and we had practiced it in the water start to finish in the pool many times. We spent hours and days and weeks and months going through what if this bolt fails? Uh, what if the cable doesn't mate? So I felt that we had covered you know, as much as we could have thought of going into this, this EVA. So we came in to work here at, at the Space Telescope Operations Control Center at Goddard. And our mechanical response team was, was watching the EVA in a conference room in Building 29. I was located down at Johnson Space Center along with the servicing mission manager. The day started out really well. You know, I was, I was trying to make it a perfect day, no problems. So they get to the section where they have to remove the handrail on STIS. And you have to remove this handrail that was designed actually to help remove and install the entire instrument. Um, in order to access the electronics board underneath. And we watched Mike Massimino attempt to do a rather simple task. All he had to do was remove four screws from a handrail. And so the two screws at the top of the handrail came off fine. The one on the bottom left comes out fine. I go to the bottom right. We could see the pistol grip tool spinning in the bolt head and the bolt wasn't coming out. I don't want to strip the thing. Oh my God. 
um, that was the first thing, you know, it's what are we going to do because this is a, a showstopper right here. For a while, probably about an hour or so, we were trying different bits on the end of the power tool and we were trying all kinds of things. You know, and one thing that crossed my mind was, what would you do? What would you do at home? You know, what would you do in your garage? You know, and I was thinking back to my garage, you know, and sometimes what would I do, you know, and I just kind of, you know, use the brute force, you know, so I thought, you know, what about just trying to break it? It, it didn't even occur to a lot of us just because it's something that you're not really ever trained to do or think of. So one of the things I did was I called back to James Cooper back here at Goddard. James Cooper called us on the speakerphone and said, hey guys, what are you, you're watching this, right? And we said, yeah, yeah, of course. We found out we did have a mock-up of this, this front panel with the handrail on it. We came up with a quick plan. Bill Mitchell said, I, I've got two handrails inside the clean room. And Ken Dickinson and I came up with a plan for how to rig up the test. So we scattered into the building to get all the materials we were going to need. Well, it was a Sunday. Nobody was around. So I, I'm, you know, I'm literally running through the halls. And I, I run to where the techs would be. And I find a guy, Gene McCallicker, who would happen to be in the building working on another project. So he said, what do you need? He, he seemed to pick up on my body language before I even asked my questions. But I told him I need a, a torque wrench and uh, I need a, a, a digital fish scale. He takes off to go get it. I go to 190. Ken Dickinson's already in there. And within minutes, Bill Mitchell comes busting through the door, carrying the handrail, still in his bunny suit and his clean room garment. We get the handrail all set up. Everything's ready to go. We text a couple pictures back and forth. James gives us the green light and Gene stands up on the table and starts pulling the handrail. And right when he got to 60 pounds, it snapped. The, actually, the bolt went flying. Once we'd done that test, then I got on our communication loops and called it to uh, Jim Corbo. So ultimately, you know, James came back and said, you know, it'll take about 60 pounds of force for them to break it off. So Goddard had done this task, fed the information to us. We talked to the flight director about it to get him comfortable. Okay, Mass, you copy that. 60 yep. pounds linear at the top of the handrail to bust off that bottom bowl. I, I think you've got that in you. Broken, Troy. I knew I could do that. What if he pulls it off and there's debris? What if he pulls off the handrail and there's a sharp edge? What if he, it takes a lot of force and it comes back and hits him? Mike Massimino was able to put some tape over the head of the bowl to contain debris that, that might go flying. And so I taped it as best I could, and Boyner was with me, helping me to tape that thing. And then, Spanish Houston, we don't have video right now, but uh, we're ready. Okay, man, you have a go. Here we go. So, disposal back, please. Everyone erupted in cheers uh, because when he pulled it off, he didn't see any debris. Um, and he knew not to touch the, the potential sharp edges, and then we could just put that fastener capture plate on and complete the STIS task. The rest of the repair went fairly well. STIS, I mean, it was fine, actually, and, uh, and STIS is working. That one or two hours that I worked on breaking the handrail, that task, that very well could go down as a highlight of my career. So the, the Goddard team did a, did a great job, and, and I'm forever in their debt. We are all explorers. It's in our DNA. We explore the depths of our oceans, our planet's inner regions, and its desolate outposts. We never stop exploring. Galileo opened our eyes to the heavens with his use of a newly invented instrument, the telescope. He started an exploration renaissance of the sky that would take us to the moon and beyond. For over a quarter century, the Hubble Space Telescope has been unlocking the mysteries of the universe. allowing us to explore the edges of space and time. From nebulas to galaxies. From newborn stars to planet formation. 
from exoplanets to our own planets and from dark matter to dark energy. Hubble has allowed us to see the breathtaking details of the universe never before seen. We salute the thousands of men and women from around the world and in space that have given humanity this incredible exploration machine. While we celebrate its past and dream of its future discoveries. The Hubble Space Telescope, inspiring the explorer in all of us.